A very good evening and thank you for joining us. Now, last week on the show, we spoke to women and men, all Ugandans in different countries, sharing their experience of COVID-19. This week, we visit rural Uganda to check on the people there. How are they handling all of this? Friends in Bushenyi, Kabale, Arua and Busia went about doing some community journalism and checking in. They shared these videos. Let's start with Arua. Me being a widow, I'm the one looking, taking care of my home. So I do brew. Now as this thing has prevented me from brewing, I'm finding life is very difficult. Even I'm worried and I've lost weight. Because hmm? these 14 days, I wonder whether I'm going to complete it indoors, I don't know. Because they can feel the calf there are uh, uh, mm. cannot make somebody to move at night and there is no money that is why you see people running up and down even though they big they beat them today they beat here the next day you find someone there also being beaten because of the same thing no food you have to go for food no water you have to go for water everything is just within the market in the town and for us we have to food like me here i'm all the way from navy who will assist me here that is the problem i have my food stuff there at home but nobody can send it to me there is no way of getting food stuff from home even my brothers and sisters they are saying now we left you in the hands of god of god with your children if god is merciful then with the time you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. I have to bear it. I have to tolerate it with my children. We have to sit. You lock yourself inside with your family. No coming out unnecessarily. Maybe you come out, you go for food stuff, you come back home. Mm -hmm. You sit in one place. Mm -hmm. No greeting each other. No hugging each other. Because the, the way they have prevented us to do that, if we don't follow, we may die. Mm -hmm. Like European says, mm -hmm. dying. Mm -hmm. Because with them, they like hugging very much. Mm -hmm. And we Africans, we like greeting, shaking hands. Mm -hmm. Once you don't shake your hands, you don't feel that you have greeted somebody. Mm -hmm. My name is Anho Panguyo. I'm a resident of Arua district. I'm a farmer and also a trader here in Arua. You know, as a business person, it's, it's, it has always been waking up in the morning, coming out to hustle, I go to the farm, or I'm selling honey and a few other things that I sell. This has drastically changed. Corona definitely has affected my life very much, not just me alone. You know, even the people at my neighborhood, the people here in Arua, and you know as a country, it has affected all of us. But particularly for myself, things things are crippled. I can't go to the farm because there is no means of transport, and I, I can't come to town every day. Now I sell honey, I can't pack honey and send to Kampala because there is no way. I used to do that using the bus. And even as you see now, just look at the roadside, there are no people because Corona has affected us everywhere. For me, I respect that curfew. I make sure, even when I come out to try and hustle, I make sure by five, I am home. Later six, I am home. So that seven, I don't have any, any trouble with the security authorities because I don't think I want to see myself being killed or taken to, to police custody. And also, I've, I've, I've realized a number of people here, actually majority of the people, are respecting curfew. They know that if they stay late, they, they know what comes to them. So I've, I've seen it and I'm really impressed that people are following this. But if there are people out there who are still staying out late, then they need to know that Corona is not food. There is no joke. Hello, I'm Gerard Iga, and I'm in uh, the tourism and events business in West Nile. Uh, I've uh, been moving around and I've seen, of course, how this pandemic has affected uh, life in town. There's, of course, no movement with border borders or cars. All you can do is walk uh, since the directives were, were given. 
uh, in the past few weeks people there's been a bigger number of people jogging around to keep fit in this period but since uh, uh, that was also prohibited uh, there's not as many people the town is mostly empty uh, since most businesses have had to close down uh, in my personal experience in the tourism space we've had to have to have we've had to cancel some of the clients that we had and it looks like even with some of the clients that we have for the rest of the year things are not uh, very clear now we do not know for sure whether we shall be able to carry out those trips or even hold the events that we had planned so uh, this pandemic has definitely affected the way of life. A lot of people are staying at home. Uh, only a few uh, are moving into town who have to who have to continue working. But generally, most people are staying at home and following the guidelines. You'll see there's a lot of hand washing stations that have been placed at uh, the markets and shops and uh, all public places. There's, uh, in some cases, I don't think that, that, that social distancing rules are being followed. I see in some places uh, you find groups of people here and there, especially in the markets. But generally, there's a lot fewer people in town and there's a lot less movement. People are staying at home and, and keeping uh, the guidelines that have been given. It's, it's really the best that we can do in this time to stay home and stay safe. Thank you. Now the biggest issues there seem to be getting used to a life where there is no personal touch. Like Alice Onega said, when you're used to shaking hands and hugging people, this is hard, but it's also doable. The other issue is survival, unable to run, to, to run your business, be it brewing like Alice and selling honey. It is tough in these times. So how do these people survive? Well, let's move on to Kabale, where Christina Katushabe, the Project Sustainable Manager for Change Alive Bwindi, sent us these videos. She works around Bwindi National Park. The project she works with works to empower community women, vulnerable women, and girls who have dropped out of school, reformed poachers, and the battle. <laughs> For us, especially as a project, uh, it's been, uh, it has caused a lot of bad effects to, to our work, whereby most of the women we work with are vulnerable women who don't even have enough land where they can do farming. Uh, they don't have any other source of, of, of money apart from the things that they've been doing with us, that is tailoring and basket weaving and all these products we've been selling them to uh, travelers, those are the tourists, uh, but right now uh, the tourists are not coming into the country. Uh, we cannot even have them at the project to continue doing the work because we may not have the source of money or we may not have funds to be able to pay these women, which means now we are really so worried about the life of these women that we are now used to making money from the project which was supporting their families paying school fees for their kids back at school. But right now they are back home. They don't have land where they are going to do farming. They don't have any other source of money. So it's really, it's really not been a good thing to us as a project. We had just concluded uh, opening uh, the Batwa project, which, is, which we thought was going to be one of our biggest projects to empower these Batwa people because they are, I think they are one of the most vulnerable people in this country. And right now, they are home. Prices have increased. Prices for food have increased. Today, I talked to one of them. I was asking them, how are you trying to survive? And uh, how are you coping up with this life? They're like, we are just home because we don't even know what we are going to do if this corona continues because we don't have any source of income. They were saying the prices for food have increased. A packet of salt right now is 1500 which is really a lot of money for someone who doesn't have any source of income. Yes, they have been struggling, but earning some little money from the things they were making, but now what is their life? How is their life going to be when they no longer earn the little money they were earning from us as a project? People are confused. Abantu 
Farmers are struggling with what to eat. When they go to look for seedlings, those are now expensive too. Even walking to get them is very hard. Cars were stopped. Bikes cannot carry people. Prices of soap, salt, posho are all high. The food we plant, some people have sweet potatoes in the gardens, but no sauce like beans, so they have to buy these. We have no money to buy food. I have an illness that needs me to frequent the hospital. I cannot afford to go now. Children are back from school. Parents have no food for them. People washing hands with water and no soap because they don't have soap. They say they are getting they, they say they are getting money from the plantation, but now they are not getting paid. People stay home now, and there are so many fights, so domestic violence cases will go up. Well, let's take a short break, and we'll be right back. Thank you for joining us. Welcome back. Now, the key issues, just before we took a break, that were raised uh, were the cost of food. I guess the thought has always been that the people upcountry will be luckier in the aspect of food access because of the farms and the gardens that they have. But it seems like a different story from what we've seen in the previous clips. Hospitals are also an issue. The tourism sector is taking the hardest hit, as predicted, and the vulnerable groups within, that is the bad word that Christina Katushabe mentions. Well, let's look at Busia, where business too is struggling. With regard to the pandemic that we are facing currently, uh, one, just like you heard from the president, that's a question of life and death. You, you either choose to have life or choose to die. But in line with the business, uh, we are affected. First of all, the houses we are using are not ours. And the, the rent is running. And as a business person, we are, we are supposed to calculate our profit monthly, per day. And it's from that that we're supposed to deduct the rent of a landlord. Now the president has put a hold on landlords not to claim for any rent from us. But we are getting into areas and we are not working. So our worry is, as, a, as business people, our worry is from the time that the ban is going to be lifted, that the business will begin at usual. And we have lost time here. We have lost money. We have not made money. And the landlords are not demanding right now, but they are counting their areas. Given the fact that we are not working, we have to adjust as, as a family. And even the children are also knowing that uh, the menu of home has changed. The menu of home has changed, but we have told them that no, this is, it is for a short time. We are going to get over it. Of course, as parents, we have to instill hope in our children. But uh, the, tr the truth is that uh, uh, what we had stopped is actually running out. And the question is, shall we be able to restock depending on uh, the statement that the president may issue as the 14 days elapses? Our customers were Kenyans. 
border. Being at the border, as you, you knew the location of the, of the market, our customers were from Kenya. But right now, they cannot cross over to this side. And so, is it on this side? We cannot cross to take the eggs on the other side. So we are there stranded. No business? No business completely. We are seated at home. How are you surviving? Eating the little we had and what our children and handovers from our children and the husband. Now, Rosebel Kagumire left Kampala shortly before the lockdown. She was one of those with foresight. We've been having conversations, debates really, about how town life is better than village life, and she was winning until it took her hours to send me these videos. The internet connection was just not good enough. Still, she says things are not so rosy in the village. Let's hear first from the women that she interviewed. My daughters are abroad. They cannot come back. I hope they are keeping safe and being cautious. They say they are, and they asked us to pray for them. The God who took them will keep them safe and bring them back home. We don't go to church, we closed our women groups, we're all staying on our own. We used to have women groups. We could get together, we could meet, share money, and use it for development and experiences. Learn from each other, now everyone is in their home. We are following the guidelines. Called me the other day and said you'll have tea leaves for supper. We have not received any help yet. We are fending for ourselves. We have some food because we are farmers. But if help is to come, we would be glad to receive things like soap, salt, posho. Immunization, antenatal, distance to the hospital is too far for our women here. They walk, but you can find women giving birth on the way or at home, and then they get complications. So I'm spending COVID-19 lockdown in the village. Um, my village is like maybe 10 kilometers away from the main road, and the hospital that is near us, the health center for, is really like te also 10 kilometers. So definitely the lockdown has affected movement you can't go on a border so it means that people who are ill or pregnant women who want to immunize have to walk really long distances um in the village where the lockdown can be easier in many ways for people in the village that you can actually walk and go to your garden you can walk to to do your work every day that the lockdown is not affecting for example agriculture um activities massively here um the the problem becomes economics when people who depend a lot maybe from cash e inflows from from their from from their children from many people they depend on they are unable to get that as economic times harden uh, and that's a big problem but also long distances it means that people who are ill and on top of that if you have to call an rdc people in villages have you know are so far removed from people like an rdc and later on it doesn't mean that everybody has the means to be able to call in terms of an emergency so it's a very difficult um condition to put on a population that is so far removed from that one person who has the power to give authority who has the authority um to actually allow you to be able to be transported to the health center so those are the key challenges and uh, speaking to some of the women of course we have seen that a lot of them depend on s some children who live in the city some who are staying abroad who are working abroad in the middle east send them some money so with the lockdown they are unable to receive that kind of funds and 
they really have to tighten their um, th their budgets but otherwise uh, people are able to move uh, outside uh, curfew hours they're able to move they're able to go to gardens so th that's at least uh, much easier if you're Rosebel Kagumire sharing her experience about what it's like in Bushenyu during this time. Let's take another short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. Now, to sum up this show, we speak to Dr. Madina Gulova, who is a senior research fellow at the Economic Policy Research Center. Thank you so much for, doini for joining us, Dr. Gulova. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, too, for having me. All right. So um, we, we spoke about some of the issues that the people up country had raised. And one of the things that comes up from the conversations that we've been playing from the different men and women um, has been, for example, number one, the sense of isolations. isolation. The, the women who are used to having group meetings don't have those support groups anymore. Um, so we cannot assume that they're going to work from them or even tell them to work from home because... I mean, it's hard enough to have a smartphone and then internet access and then these applications. So um, therein lies one of their problems. This, the issue around women groups, um, basically, uh, Josephine, the whole issue of COVID um, is not, uh, it's a very complex issue. And uh, the environment, what we have to know, the environment really is not uh, the same business as usual. And uh, um, basically what we have to do is uh, learn that because of the complexities of the, the environment we are dealing with now, we need to be cognizant of this fact as we're doing issues today. You find yourself, myself right now, I cannot go to do any business even in town or not the day-to-day -day aspects of it. Even that's the same thing within the rural areas. The same business meeting we've been having for your support systems, really, at this point in time, that support system, if it is continue working, they need to stay healthy. And either whether it's through um, just uh, someone who can uh, come now, they say the social distancing issue, if one can walk to the other and they chat a bit, but uh, while we look at this um, COVID environment as a business as new as business unusual. It's something that we have to appreciate. And then um, also the rural women need to make sure they appreciate this that's not going to be in the long run. How best can they think about extra initiatives of meeting to make sure this um, comes together as uh, rural women? Uh, they, this is a very complex environment, I must say. And uh, these social networks, the social networks will also not work if, if, if one of them died. So then the law collapse. They need to really keep healthy. But we need to think of the new innovations. How can we really innovate around meeting to make sure the social networks keep alive? I think that brings us then to the issue that's happening just about everywhere of domestic violence. Um, the bars are locked and somebody mentioned it. The bars are locked so they have nowhere to go and drink from. Um, and then we also know that the close proximity for hours on end, day in, day out, that's bound to be a recipe for um, this kind of situation. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, I think definitely... Um, for, for those whose economic living has been in um, making the small breweries or making the little liquor or tonto, and uh, you know social gatherings are not allowed. And, uh, but I, by the end of the day, what we have to recognize is the directives were you can still drink but from home, you know? And um, so for those who actually still make the business from, um, from making the local brew where people have to gather, you can encourage your customers to come and buy the brew during the day and they kindly drink it at home, you know? And uh, at the end of the day, uh, 
you who's trying to make an economic living from the brew, you still continue living. For that person who wants to drink, continues drinking from home. But again, <laughs> this issue of domestic violence, when even the remittances to buy booze are actually low. Now, for, for those who have been getting some of the money from us and the urban centers, they do not have any more money to buy the booze. So I really don't know how they'll continue with the social networks uh, amidst low income for those who are actually purchasing. But those who are actually in the business of doing it can continue doing it during the day and continue getting their customers to actually purchase it for consumption at home. Even they can do deliveries by 2 p.m. as the president said it is possible. All right. Well, um, since you mentioned that, let's look at the business angle that a lot of them mentioned. Um, yes, there's a lady who was brewing alcohol. Then there's a lady who now can't send honey to Kampala for people to buy. Then mm -hmm. there's a lady in Busia whose clients are all from Kenya. So they're not coming in and she can't go to them. So there's, there's a problem there as well. So there's quite a bit of a hit on businesses as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, when I go back to the, the first argument I had made, had made, that we know we are dealing with a, an environment which is not the same. It's a very complex one. And uh, the issues around businesses, um, it's um, you, you, Josephine, yourself in a business. It's not necessarily that you have to sell goods, but you're also doing a business. Me as a researcher, it's a business. Uh, those who have to open shops, as you've said, customers have to come in. It's also a business. So how do you look at it in this way that in this complex environment, you have to think beyond what's happening now? It's just appreciating that your, your customers from Kenya you, um, might bring in the COVID for you. Again, then it, is, um, it becomes a dead end. So if the customers from Kenya are no longer coming in, and you know the transportation systems, as you said to someone from Arua who's not bringing any more honey, uh, because the transportation systems have gone down, and then those who are actually purchasing, us who are purchasing, these kind of goods. Also, our movements are now limited. So at the end of the day, both the consumer and the person who is owning the business, despite the fact that they let them open, still is not going to work because the people who buy from you can no longer really come in the big numbers that you are actually having before. The, the, the aspect here now is to make sure it's in your mind that this is a short-term measure, and let's see what happens on the 14th, what government will do. If they will also now have to go up country and uh, start engaging uh, with the same kind of persons on how best can they support them in their support systems or making little ends meet in terms of businesses. Because I think by the 14th, as the president said, or 17th, things might change. And then the businesses go back to operating as normal. He said, this is something which is short. So the issue is how can you think about it as a short-term environmental issue that is happening now within the business environment. But things are, might happen and improve within no time. Right. So the honey leg should be optimistic uh, that we, the transport systems, even if they open for her now, we cannot buy since we can't move. Yeah. Even the persons in Kenya, if they opened it up for her, I think the Kenyan government also has a role to play here. They are not allowing their persons to move across the borders. So then she needs to see how best, or they need to see how we can look at the small businesses to just make ends meet for now, a short time, as the long-term measures come in. Well, I guess that also speaks to the people who are speaking about the tourism sector. Um, most of the women in, in, in Bwindi, as we heard from Christina, who are tailoring mm -hmm. and weaving and they're targeting the tourists who are coming in. But we know that the president had already addressed this so many times, saying the tourism sector would be mm -hmm. one of the hardest hit. Of course, we have Gerald in Arua mm -hmm. who, who handles events and there's no, you can't put a time to those now because you don't yes, know when sure. this whole situation is mm -hmm. going to change. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the increased prices of things. And we had um, Christina from... Uh, Kanungu speaking about the Batwa for whom this 1,500 shillings packet of salt is just not feasible. Mm. So there's an increase to salt to 
uh, mm. soap to posho to all of the things that are basic right now. The directors were very clear that let's not increase the basics, the basic necessities. Those who had actually increased the salt should not have increased it. The sugar issues should not have increased. Since the production lines, the transportation lines for these commodities are still being made open. Now, enforcement needs to be really um, put into high gear here. Whereby, I don't know if they say the stick and carrot or whistleblowers, where people really need to report this uh, to the authorities at hand, that uh, so and so have been cruised the pricing for the salt and issues because of COVID, because the directors were here that the basic necessities should not have any increase incrementals uh, on top. I know within my neighborhood, also the salt actually increased from, uh, I think, 800 to 1,400. But then, uh, and then to 3,000. Then when the directive went out and the enforcement came on, they actually brought it back down, but not so <laughs> down to the 800 it was before. It is now around 1,000, I think 200. But now the issue is how do you make sure that the enforcement arm does its job to put the directive of non-incrementals work? Okay. Then that lady does not suffer from the high incremental salt of 1,400, because this is someone taking advantage um, of the situation. All right. I, um, another thing that keeps coming up now that we're talking about food and uh, uh, condiments, one of the issues that the, the, the president mentioned was the thought that in the villages it's going to be easier for people during this time because they have access to farms and to gardens, so they're going to have food. But when we listen to them mm. all speaking, <coughs> it's, it doesn't seem as easy as that. They, some of them say, look, if in my garden I've been growing chili or I've been growing bananas, that's, that's all I can feed on for this period of time. Mm -hmm. Because number one, I don't have another source of income. Or number two, I, um, it's all I have. If I have to get something else, I have to go very long distances to be able to get, buy something, or buy beans. So I'm going to just eat maize, matoke, maize, matoke, and I have no source. So are we going to do butter tread? What are we going to do? Uh, uh, you know, Jonathan, that's one of the issues that's actually so not so easy to answer. Um, because when I look back uh, at some of the situations, of course, this, some of these complaints can come in based on the fact that um, the, the urban counterparts are receiving some of this help that the rural people are not actually receiving based As on this um, ideology that um, that the rural areas have food. And I think that's partly where the, some of the antagonism is coming in from. But you might find that, indeed, for sure, that household that has been growing even the sweet potato or the cassava, in that sense, their basket of feeding has not changed even within this COVID, whether they've been taking either that cassava with tea. But it's that dissatisfaction of giving a Kampala person the whole basket of the meal. Of the, of the sauce plus the food and then plus the milk as some see as a luxury. So they need, to, they also feel left out in this case, that we have been doing this for a long time and you never come in to give us the, the other bit of it. So those I would actually feel sorry for more in the rural areas would have been, those whose um, agricultural traits have been more on those what we talked about, the chilies, these things which you cannot just consume. <laughs> Your whole garden has been full of chili. Your whole garden has been full of, uh, what should I say, carrots. There's no food. But if you go back to the hard times, <laughs> the hunger times, if it was not even COVID, uh, I don't think even the rural households would have complained even if they had only cassava for, for feeding, even if it's for a week, if they can have cassava with water. But it's the dissatisfaction of seeing that delivery. Yeah. So we have to look at the mindset of how do you handle that mindset of someone who's seen feeling that they are being left out on this icing of the cake when they are living in that similar situation of you have this, but you do not have that. So government needs to address that probably to, to make sure it comes its citizens uh, up country in terms of why they focused on the urban areas and giving them this whole basket of, uh, of food. 
and then the rural areas are miss are living the way the day they usually live normally. Right. Though they have the hardship of no one is buying their food even the if they went to the market, because that is the actual which the the hardship would have brought out. That now they have food to sell to buy the supplementary, but there are now no cars actually coming in um, abundance to buy this excessive matoke, this excessive uh, carrots. For that, you can make extra means to buy the beans. Yeah. So that's what is actually missing for them. Well, another thing that comes in when it's uh, on the choice of food, it's children are back home for the holidays. And then you have the people from Kampala who managed to make their way to the village before time. <laughs> so they have extra mouths <laughs> to feed. Um, another mm. issue, well, just two more issues before we close. One of the issues that also comes up is the anxiety and the dependence on, on, on first of all, the anxiety because some of your children, one of the women says her, her daughters are all abroad. So they're probably in the UAE mm. or some, as somebody mentioned. And others for them because now they cannot support themselves they're dependent on their children on whatever they mm. can send but you know when you when you send the money it's going to go to either mobile money or it's going to go to um you can't send it on a bus anymore so they have to mm. find a way to get this money so there's that anxiety and that dependence that's also coming in and mm. i I've finally the last issue that comes up is um immunization antenatal care and the pregnant women, all of these people <laughs> having to find a way to make their way to hospitals which are not very near to them and mm. there's no means of transport. So one of the women says that we're, we're seeing pregnant women delivering on the way to hospital and then there are those complications. Mm. And now women have gone back to delivering babies from within their homes. And we know that that's a very delicate situation. That's right. Uh, I think that the situation is dire, probably because uh, there are some things when such some of these difficulties actually occur, that you realize some of the biggest changes in the systems that we have. I know um, government for some time, at least on the health angle, it's, it, it has indicated that they have strong village uh, health systems. And they have what they call emergency transportation systems for pregnant women in hard to reach areas. But now, whereas this has been very emphasized in the Karamoja region, then that's why you are seeing some of the hard to reach areas for village health teams for the non Karamoja regions happening. So I think those are the gaps that I, I think as Minister of Health, those who are in the Ministry of Health need to look out for. That if some of these things happened, then the hard to reach areas beyond Karamoja need the kind of extra services that's such that we don't have their situations of women giving birth on the roadside. Or, of course, those on antenatal can always stagger the antenatal um, uh, seeking. But those who are giving birth for sure, they need that kind of help. And uh, the emergence in terms of health systems and the gaps that is, this is showing us is critical. That we need to actually stagger and implement health systems comprehensively. In our rural areas, it's really dire. Either the, this LC, before the, the, these women, the border borders were taking them as, of course, the, the situation it was before, then they need to allow them to still not to walk and uh, they think out of the box and let these, the, the women board the border borders for, for, for this um, uh, emergency treatment out there. Because we cannot go back to giving birth from our, our kitchens as it was before. But the health, the health system has gaps, and I think that's what COVID has shown, uh, that emergency health systems all over are needed, even in the rural areas that are not necessarily Karamoja. And then um, when you look at this old lady who, who talked about, the, or sorry, maybe not old lady, whose dependency is on her children who are abroad uh, for remittances, if, if for sure, they're also in that hard situation, then um, I know they are not working, probably also out there, if they are chatting with their parents down here, they might not be working. But even if they send the little remittances back to her, she can't pick it. Um, it's uh, even that's when, even that's when very far. Those who have been depending on me for remittances to upcountry, 
cannot get it because for sure I find it hard to walk to the bank all the way to town to just make a withdrawal uh, of a certain magnitude because of a need up country. I'll tell them, can you please, it's, if it's not urgent, I'm not going to send the money now because uh, it's hard for me to travel. It's hard for me to send it for even to withdraw. So either we have to go through the social networks, which are already breaking lines you're talking about, uh, to send the kind of resources. But uh, the fabric in terms of remittances from abroad, I think the situation also sending back home is not that easy. Yeah. And um, if, if they are not planned in advance for their mom, to send some of this money for stock ups, then that's where also the problem is also coming in that she cannot have any saved up money for these three weeks that we've been under lockup. Or if there is, they can think of anything of any neighbor who can support and they send mobile money. Since nowadays, even sending remittances, you don't need to go to the bank or through or Western Union. You can directly send to someone's mobile uh phone and then it works out so it's still going to be a dire situation even for those who depend on us even as if we are in kampala and they're up country all right and because of movement all right well dr Glover, how are you doing yourself in this lockdown oh uh, I, I work from home most of the time uh it's, it has not been easy but um i think as you can see, I lock up, I do my activities from home as a researcher. For us, they uh, can work anywhere. And it's also because of technology, being technology averse and some little income that I can speak to you. Otherwise, I would have told you, Josephine, I don't have money for data. <laughs> I would have said that, Josephine, I have no time for data. I have no money for data. I have no computer. And then, uh, it would have been a bit difficult to, of course, engage, but um, it's some of the things that uh, make it easier if you're technology averse and you have a bit of some bit of um, saving to continue the discussions going. But right. of course, working from home with toddlers is a, is a bit a challenge <laughs> where everyone knows you're there, you have to cook a bit while you're working. <laughs> yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's the thing of juggling and yeah. then uh, and going on. I think that we must all learn to do during this period. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Glover, for taking the time to speak with us. I thank you too for having me, Josephine. It's a pleasure. All right. Anytime. All right. You take care. Um, well, what Getting comes up. out of this conversation, a very strong um, thing that we see throughout the conversation, is that people are listening, and they're listening good and trying to follow the guidelines as best as they can. Well, as we close the show, I want to send a big thank, thank you to, first of all, Dr. Medina Gulova, to Rosbel Kagumire in Busheni, to Christina Katushabe in Kanungu, to Gerald Iga in Arua, and to David Awori in Busia. Thank you so much for sending in those videos to show us what's happening in your area. And thank you for watching. Have a great weekend. Coming up is NTV Weekend Edition.